naked mole rats. So I, I saw one, um, one, one of your papers, I think, where you talked about, is it the Gompertz rule that, you know, as things get older, they, they tend to have higher mortality. But this is not true for naked mole rats. However, they do epigenetically age. And it, it, this just seems very strange that both of these things are true. Uh, so, uh, so one thing is, yeah, can you talk about why they, you know, they, don't, they don't die, that you saw that basically mortality is not related to age? Is, is that correct? Yes, that's true. That, that's correct. And, um, you know, there may be various explanations for that, but just demographically, because they live so long, uh, mm. And uh, animals that are kept in research colonies or zoo colonies, uh, their longevity is uh, not that different from <laughs> the time frame of the investigators that are following them in the study. Uh, so we don't really have that many old animals uh, to really measure um, mm. enough age-related mortality. But they die of other causes, for example, because they live in the uh, you social colony where some animals would younger animals would fight for dominance, so they occasionally kill each other, mm. <laughs> and uh, that actually is the biggest cause of mortality in the colony, um, and that is not related to age. Um, so this creates you know kind of demographic picture where with age mortality doesn't change. So it doesn't mean necessarily that they are that they do not age. Uh, because uh, they change over time. Uh, for example, if I showed you a five-year-old naked mole rat and a 25-year-old naked mole rat, you would probably guess mm -hmm. <laughs> which one is older. So it's not that they completely do not change. Um, but they don't show this increased mortality and uh, they don't uh, get more diseases. So that is probably the most uh, um you know, interesting part there that mm. even even they change slightly in appearance, but they they stay healthy. Uh, so this is maybe more like uh, human centenarians who, well, they change uh, physically, but they remain very healthy for much longer. So that's probably what we see in naked morals. That's a model of very healthy aging. So there is still epigenetic age, but it's decoupled from disease. Right. So, so I saw you upped the uh, maximum lifespan from 30 to 40. I, I guess one of your naked mole rats has lived a long time. No, that's not ours. This it's one was ours. from Shelley Buffenstein's colony. So she okay. announced <laughs> that now the record is 41. Wow. And so we have to update it. That's, that's amazing. So I, I believe there's a way of looking at uh, the way the, at the pace of epigenetic aging and using that to determine the theoretical maximum lifespan of an animal, or at least a, there's a correlation between the two. Um, have you have you looked at that to see what kind of epigenetically the maximum lifespan would be? Yeah, this is a good question. And uh, of course, there is big, big error here. Mm. Uh, but I, I should probably ask my good colleague Steve Horvath and mm. Vadim Gladyshev to look into that. So then maybe I can give you a more accurate number. Okay. No, I, yeah, I just wondered, because I, I think Dr. Horvath has... But it's possible. You know, I discussed it with both of them, and we mm. all agree that um, maximum lifespan may be longer. And that may be another reason uh, that we don't see increased mortality, that we're still looking at animals that are not super old. Right. relative to their maximum lifespan. Ah, that's true, because we, we don't really know what their maximum lifespan is. One of the main things you've noticed about naked mole is they have this extra hyaluronic acid. Do they have other adaptions? Or is hyaluronic acid like the main one? And what would that kind of say about the hallmarks of aging? We've got like nine hallmarks of aging. Does hyaluronic acid like solve all of them? <laughs> well, you know, evolution doesn't work with <laughs> one mechanism if you increase right. lifespan of this creature there are probably many things that change mm -hmm. um, they may have different um, contribution but you know definitely it's not one mm -hmm. hyaluronic acid is perhaps you know very striking difference that was just so easy mm -hmm. to see when we started looking 
but we also we and others uh, find various uh, adaptations in naked morads that touch upon all of the hallmarks of aging right. um including better dna repair um and um, more accurate protein synthesis so this is the work from our group where we found mm-hmm. that naked morad rarely make mistakes in proteins so their protein translation is super accurate even their ribosome has a slightly different structure for making accurate mm-hmm. protein uh, we find uh, also some adaptations in the way they maintain their stem cells, which may actually be linked to hyaluronic acid because hyaluronic acid, it makes microenvironment that's important for stem cells as well. Mm. Um, So there were also papers published on increased autophagy in the naked morad, which again would be linked to proteostasis. Mm. But from other side, like we see, they make proteins more accurately, but they may also be more efficient at removing bad proteins. So there are many adaptations, and there are many adaptations also related to cancer resistance. Mm-hmm. Um, so it, it's a lot. It's a lot, <laughs> right. Okay. When you look at all the different animals, do you see, because you've looked at like bowhead whales and bats and naked mole rats, so do you see a commonality about how they solve the problems of aging? Are they all different or is there common themes in each one we see both uh, interesting mm-hmm. there are some uh pathways uh that are quite concerned for example dna repair we mm-hmm. see that longer lived uh, animals all of them have better dna repair uh how they re- achieve that may be somewhat different for example we published uh, that sirtuin 6 is more active in long-lived species. So mm-hmm. this, again, seems to be a concerned feature. If, you, if you're long-lived, you have good sirtuin 6, you have really good DNA repair. Uh, but in addition to that, we find some more unique adaptations, like hyaluronic acid, for example, quite unique to naked morad. Um, and the um, bats have like a whole different story as well mm. but but we find very good dna repair in bats so it's a combination we can find, have some conserved pathways that like we know all long-lived species have to somehow modify these pathways and then there may be more unique uh private strategies that are used mm. by individual long-lived species so um you know once we understand all of them we would have a, a toolbox like, which we can combine different mm inventions from different creatures and then hopefully put them all together yes yeah i mean it'd be interesting to do that genetically i mean if you could just have like a cassette of genes and you input them into someone and then you have all these separate ways of um kind of increasing your longevity that would be really interesting um so you also looked at i saw you, you looked at bowhead whales which are amazing creatures so do we know what their maximum lifespan is i mean we 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 say like 200 but that's that's because we think it really is 200 or because that's just the oldest we've seen well it may be above 200 right um but there were whales captured uh that had age around 200 uh and um, it's difficult to have precise age, unless mm. unless we know the birthday, <laughs> oh, yeah. uh, but methods used uh, for whales were looking at uh, amino acid racemization within the eye, uh, because proteins turn over very slowly, almost not at all, in the eye, and it's possible to use them for this kind of dating. Uh, but of course, there is some error there. You cannot use it for mice, for example, because there will be like plus minus 10 years. Mm. Uh, and those numbers were quite close to 200. And then there was one whale uh, that was um, captured and it had pieces of a harpoon lodged in its tissues. And uh, the harpoon had the date on it. So from that was the number 211 because... Supposedly, it was first um, harpooned when it was already grown up, at least, not mm-hmm. uh, baby. Um, and then it lived another 
211 years. Uh, so that was one whale <laughs> that made a lot of news. Mm. But uh, there were other whales as well for which uh, other dating methods we utilize. So on ever you know, altogether we have pretty good evidence that they can live up to 200 years and perhaps longer. And they have a unique way of suppressing cancer, right? They, they have lots of cells, so they, they, they have a higher <laughs> chance of having cancer. Um, can you, so they have a special gene, I, I forgot the name, um, that, it, that uh, it, it repairs, it does better repair, I think, of the DNA after a break. So can you talk about how that works? And, and, and do we have that gene as well? Yes, we have that gene. We have the gene. It's called the cold-induced RNA binding protein. Mm. Um, it responds to cold, which kind of makes sense because <laughs> whale, uh, bowhead whale lives in the Arctic. Mm. Uh, but a whale, bowhead whale has a hundred times more of this protein. It is very, very abundant. In human, we have it, but it, you can hardly identify it. So we make mm. very little... Um, and most other species we've tested make very little. We can we can make a little induce a little bit more if we uh, you know expose ourselves to brief bout of cold, like go mm. in the cold shower. Um, but we don't really reach the level of bowhead whale, right? Because they have a lot, and they don't even need to induce it. They, they always have a lot. Uh, and uh, this gene is important for DNA repair. Uh, we found that whale is much more efficient at DNA repair, and it's also more accurate. It makes much fewer mistakes. Right. So, has that tempted you to take cold baths? <laughs> yes, I think it's good to take it. Uh, you know, the benefits of uh, cold showers um, are documented in various mm. uh, folk medicine, especially in Nordic countries, people go yeah. to sauna and jump <laughs> in cold water and uh, it elevates the mood. Mm. Um, it may also help your genome. <laughs> 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 but of course, this is um, something we still, we would have to do much more research, research. to claim that. Uh, right. But in principle, yeah, that something could be done. Again, you know, I don't think Chronic cold exposure is necessarily good because we are warm-blooded creatures and we cannot just lower our body temperature easily. So when we are exposed to cold and you know we just start making more energy to keep our bodies at the same 37 degrees. Uh, yeah. But brief, like brief cold swim or cold shower mm -hmm. can you know, just briefly lower uh, the temperature. So that may be enough to induce care. But, but again, we, we haven't really studied that enough, mm -hmm. um, you know, using non-whale system. <laughs> but in the whale, we see that um, it is very important for DNA repair. We also see that if we take human cells and culture and give them some brief cold exposure, we can increase the level of care. But we haven't studied it on the level of organism. So that's something we would like to do. Right. So in, in vitro, it, it seems to work. Well, in vitro, but also we want to test it in mice. You know, what's the optimal regimen right. to get induction of this gene? Right. Wow. Okay. It's a bit, yeah. So it's, you're going to give mice like cold bars. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And we also will look for various... Um, pharmacological ways because yeah right. maybe not everyone wants to take cold baths you know there, there should be a pharmacological way to um trick ourselves into thinking we are taking cold bath right that, that is a possibility that not everyone wants to have a cold bath yeah uh, one question like bowhead whales i believe have, have a lot of fat right mm -hmm. i think that's how they insulate themselves yes but their flat their fat i assume is non-inflammatory yeah, that is another very interesting question. And, you know, to our earlier discussion of naked moras, like, is this the only mechanism? I'm sure mm -hmm. there are many other um, pro-longevity adaptations that 
are very, very interesting. And yeah, one of them would be, how can you be so fat <laughs> and not suffer any metabolic <laughs> consequences of that? Uh, so they must have some strategies to deal with that. <clears throat> mm-hmm. And uh, we don't really know it. So we right now we are doing metabolomic studies on whales. Um, mm-hmm. And we hope that from that, we can maybe get some clues into how they can deal with mm-hmm. a necessity of having this <clears throat> uh, very thick layer of uh, fat blubber. And, right. uh, you know, it, it doesn't affect negatively the health at all. No, it's it's kind of interesting that. Okay. Oh, is it brown fat or is it white fat? Well, it's it's white mostly, but mm-hmm. um, you know they they also should have brown fat. I, mm-hmm. I think there are studies of it. I must admit I'm not an expert in this, but that's actually a good question. If the ratio of brown mm-hmm. fat would differ in the whale, mm-hmm. I would assume that it does, and there mm-hmm. may be literature on that that I'm not aware. Okay. Yeah, I did. but you wouldn't want brown fat on the outside. Otherwise, you just it would spend all its time. No, it, no, all its but energy the, would, yeah, yes, uh, but the you know they they need to maintain their energy as well. Yeah. Although you know their giant size makes it easier because their surface to volume ratio mm-hmm. is different. Yes, but still, they live in the water that's at around uh, zero degrees Celsius because it, it's salt water, so it's not even mm. plus four. Wow. Yeah, I, that's interesting. Okay, so uh, Dr. Gubanova, where can people follow what you're doing? Follow your research? Well, I, I must admit, I'm still not very active on social media, which I mm. probably should. <laughs> so you can find, uh, of course, uh, look at my lab website mm. and, um, you know, mm. publications. Mm-hmm. Uh, but at the moment, I really, I don't have the right. Twitter <laughs> okay. or to share. But we we are trying to we are trying to talk about our findings and report them so that people can right. be up to date yeah. on what we are doing. Yes, thank you. That's that's really good. And I saw that uh, you had you published the the talk on the whale or, or the the paper of the whale on a bioarchive. Yes, yes, it's on bioarchive, and uh, yeah, it's in the process of being peer reviewed. <laughs> right. Okay, so we can find it on bio- bioarchive, and of course, there's always PubMed. Okay, uh, Dr. Gorbanova, thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's been great talking to you, and uh, I'd love welcome. to talk to you again. Okay, thank you so much. Thank you.